uh, Mary Everstadt is a, an essayist, a novelist, an author of several influential works of nonfiction, including How the West Really Lost God, which I recommend highly, A uh, New Theory of Secularization, and uh, more recently about the danger to believe. It's dangerous uh, to believe. What's the real title, Mary? I'm sorry. The, the, it's the danger. It's dangerous to believe, okay, which I also highly recommend. Um, <clears throat> Adam and Eve after the pill, paradoxes of the sexual revolution, and Home Alone in America. She also wrote a novel, The Loser Letters, which is a, <laughs> a comic tale of life, death, and atheism. And it's been adapted for the stage. I assume that that was last year, 2016. Um, and she's also author of an anthology, Why I Turned Right, uh, Leading Baby Boom Conservatives Chronicle Their Political Journeys. So, she's a frequent contributor to magazines and journals, including Time, The Wall Street Journal, National Review, The Weekly Standard, and First Things. She served as editor of the Public Interest, National Interest, and Policy Review. She's been associated with various think tanks, including the Hoover Institution and the uh, Ethics and Public Policy Center. And uh, she founded a literary organization called the Kirkpatrick Society to mentor uh, budding and uh, developing writers. From 1985 to 87, she was a member of the policy planning staff of the U.S. State Department. She was a speech writer for former Secretary of State George Shultz and a special assistant to Ambassador Jean J. Kirkpatrick at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations. She's also a managing editor of Public Interest. She was a four-year Telluride scholar at Cornell University, where she graduated magna cum laude. She's married to, as we mentioned, demographer Nicholas Everstadt, and they have four children, and we're delighted that she would be with us. Mary. to come a couple of times before, and I was so moved by the invitation and by this opportunity to decide not to uh, just rehearse things that I had rehearsed before, but rather to write something for you from the ground up uh, at what seems like a propitious time to try and think through some big things. So I'm honored by the presence of all of you, and I thank you for this opportunity to reason together. Many people in our time have the sense that the terrain of Western civilization has shifted, perhaps irretrievably. They point to the political and cultural tumult that seem to be everywhere these days, to the anger and incendiary tone of so much public discourse, and above all, to the defiance and repudiation in some powerful venues of the Judeo-Christianity that created civilization as we know it in the first place. And surveying the landscape out there from Main Street to Hollywood or Snapchat to Netflix, one can't help but suspect they're onto something. Once, belief in God and traditional religion were unremarkable. Now, increasing numbers of Western people seem to think that both those things require explanation, and perhaps also, to use a favorite word of the moment, resistance. That difference between cheering God and jeering God is not just a sea change. It is wholly unchartered, open water regardless of who is captaining the White House or any other place. Consider just a few illustrations. 
In the past, during the past 10 years, flagship Christian colleges have come under accreditation attack. Both King's College in New York and Gordon College in Massachusetts leap to mind. Some adversaries of organized religion now argue that Christian institutions are unworthy of tax-exempt status, period. Christian homeschooling remains a bete noire of progressives and challenged in one state after another. Traditional ideas of the family are said by some to menace other people in the public square, and they are suddenly figuring into lawsuits galore, about which more later. As for popular culture, as everybody knows, practicing Christians, and especially traditional religious people, are perennial whipping boys, or whipping people, <laughs> almost invariably portrayed as dull or hypocritical or both. Or to put it differently, the Book of Mormon is a popular musical. The Book of Lena Dunham or the Book of Planned Parenthood is not. So what should we call this civilizational turn, this new time that we have entered, willingly or not? Well, to some people, the most apt description is that we live in a post-Christian age. It's understandable why people resort to that label, given the determination with which some secularists now try to scrub the public square clear of anything remotely religious. We're told increasingly that religion is something to be practiced in private, for example. We've seen case after case of religious symbolism suppressed where once it was allowed, like nativity scenes or copies of the Ten Commandments removed from public grounds. So you can see where post-Christian might come from. But even so, I admit to a hesitancy about that term. The trouble with post-Christian is that it seems to assume exactly what the adversaries of religion assume, that there is some unfolding of capital H history in which religion is just some stage that societies move through before moving on. So the first point I would make in trying to name the figurative animals out there is that while what's distinctive about our time is its newly hostile attitude toward organized religion, post-Christian may not be the most useful term to capture that change. Now we are fortunate because thoughtful observers from all over have recently been offering up analyses and metaphors through which religious believers today might understand this great change. Eight years ago, Richard John Newhouse called this new place American Babylon. Today, a number of other thinkers offer variations on that same theme of believers as newly born outsiders in our culture. Thus, writer Rod Dreher speaks of a Benedict option for religious traditionalists to withdraw from the toxicity of the world and retrench. George Weigel, in an annual lecture delivered a few weeks ago, calls now for a new great awakening, meaning the rebirth of the ideas about the human person, human community, and human destiny that once informed the American experiment and can inform it again. Archbishop Charles Chaput of Philadelphia has just this week published a new book whose title, Strangers in a Strange Land, invites us to entertain the analogy between our time and the book of Exodus. And professor of English Anthony Esselin opens his new book, Out of the Ashes, with these words. In this book, I shall indulge myself in one of civilized man's most cherished privileges. I shall decry the decay of civilization. This list could continue, and obviously these and other thinkers trying to read the signs of the times 
share the same sense of purpose, increasingly so. I'm here tonight to offer an argument that is compatible with just about all their particulars, but that focuses uniquely on the importance of one factor that I think is critical to understanding where we are. That is the state of the family and the relationship between the family and the rest of society. First, I'd like to argue that the proper name for what we are now witnessing in the countries of the advanced West is paganization. Second, I'd like to elaborate on what the features of this new paganism are. And third, in light of all that, I'd like to close by discussing what this newly pagan time means for family and faith in the future. I think we should call this a pagan time because the essence of paganism is that it is defined in opposition to Christianity and other traditional world faiths. We can also call this a paganizing time in the sense that paganism seems to be spreading, especially in corridors of influence, most obviously secular universities and popular culture. This paganization is especially ascendant among the young. Surveys and polls for years have documented a rise in people who check none of the above when asked for religious affiliation. As of 2017, according to Pew Research, the combination of self-described atheists and self-described nuns is the fastest growing group of opinion on religion in the United States. So we live in a paganizing or re-paganizing time. And here I would like to advance a thesis that has not been advanced before, so far as I know. It's that the essential features of today's new paganism are not incidental to the collapse of the family across the West. To the contrary, essential features of this new paganism appear to be driven by the collapse of the family across the West. To put the point differently, no family collapse, no new paganism. I'd like to illustrate this thesis by looking in a little detail at some of the features of the new paganism, the better to understand what people of faith are contending with these days. Believe it or not, there is good news coming, but first we have to name the animals out there as accurately as we can. So what do we know about this new paganism? We know first that the antipathy we see toward religion today is not simply the absence of religion itself. The idea that today's Western people are simply secular is repeated frequently these days. Reporting on the latest round of numbers in the rise of nuns, for example, uh, an essay last year in National Geographic titled, The World's Newest Major Religion is No Religion. But I don't think that's right. In my latest book, It's Dangerous to Believe, I spend some time disputing this notion that the division out there is between believers on the one side and unbelievers on the other. To the contrary, all human beings are people of some faith. The question is, what do they put their faith in? I think the evidence shows that a new chapter has opened in American and indeed Western history in which people of traditional faith are on the receiving end of an ascendant secularism as they have never been before, and that the treatment of today's religious believers is unjust and violates traditional American understanding of fair play. Evidence also shows another important development unique to our time. Beneath the mercilessness and vindictiveness of today's anti-religious atmosphere is something deep and new. 
the development of a rival faith, a rival secularist faith that sees Christianity as a competitor to be crushed rather than as a different set of beliefs to be tolerated. So what else can we say about this rival faith, also known as the new paganism? Well, for one thing, it behaves in ways that only a faith would behave. It includes within its ranks the equivalent of religious zealots. Consider one snapshot, the scene on the steps of the Supreme Court of the United States on June 27, 2016, following the announcement of the decision in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt, which was the Texas abortion decision uh, taken by a victory by proponents of abortion on demand. All day long after that decision was announced, videos documented what resulted a huge outdoor party, spilling from the court steps out into the city, a gyrating, weeping, waving, screaming sea of people, mostly women, behaving as if they were in the throes of religious ecstasy. This was not politics as usual. This was not even politics out of the box as usual as uh, you might find with an Occupy Wall Street demonstration. This was something different. They were in religious ecstasy, their kind of religious ecstasy, in which abortion on demand is the equivalent of a central sacrament, the repetition of which is judged essential to their quasi-theology. Or consider another snapshot, the Women's March on Washington from a few weeks ago much larger and generally better behaved, um, barring incidents of gross violence and 200 arrests. This public demonstration, too, was driven in large part by one thing, animus against traditional morality. Sexual revolution theology about abortion once again proved central. The only women's group disinvited was a pro-life group. Think about that. When tacitly asked to choose between women and abortion on demand, the women chose abortion. That's what a religion looks like. The roots of this religion are not in science, and they are not in lofty goals like diversity and tolerance. They are grounded, rather, in a set of beliefs centered on the sexual revolution. So the point is, not only that religious traditionalism now confronts a rival faith in the secular societies of the West, although it certainly does that, the point is that the confrontation would not even exist apart from the sexual revolution and the need of its champions to defend their prerogatives. Consider more evidence, the new atheist. It is just about exactly 10 years ago since the new atheists uh, were riding a wave of bestsellers. Many interesting things were said about their arguments in the course of all the commentary. But one important fact, I think, largely escaped notice. The new atheists all defend the sexual revolution and attack traditional religious morality to a man and that is not a politically incorrect formulation because all of the new atheists actually are men. Hitchens, Dawkins, Harris, et al. have all been of one mind about the traditional Christian rule book. They dismiss it as ridiculous. This uniformity of opinion tells us something. Attacking the traditional moral code isn't just something that atheists do. It's not some accidental byproduct of their other theories. To the contrary, attacking the Christian moral code is such a dominant theme of their thought that it's fair to ask whether they would even be atheists if the code didn't exist. And it's not just the new atheists. Sixty years ago, alpha atheist Bertrand Russell published a classic called Why I Am Not a Christian, 
uh, which is a litany of mockery and complaints about the shortcomings uh, of organized religion as he saw them. Here's the quote. The worst feature of the Christian religion, he wrote, is its attitude towards sex, an attitude so morbid and unnatural that it can be understood only when taken in relation to the sickness of the civilized world at the time the Roman Empire was decaying." Unquote. So think about that. Of all the problems he saw with organized religion, in this book-length treatise, the one he judged to be most serious was the existence of the traditional Christian moral code. This tells us again that the desire to be free of traditional morality and to repudiate the importance of the traditional family is a powerful and hitherto unseen engine of secularization itself. In short, the first thing to understand about the new paganism is that it is a rival faith whether or not its followers understand themselves to be people of faith. So here's a second feature of this newly developed competitor to traditional faith, and this is one that I think we're all more aware of all the time. That is its denial of any essential distinction between male and female. The new paganism drives toward androgyny. In 1943, C.S. Lewis wrote a book called The Abolition of Man. He argued that dire consequences would follow from humanity's increasing denial of natural law. Sixty-four years later, the consequences of that denial have taken forms so Byzantine and involuted that even the great philosopher could not have foreseen them. Consider some examples from a new book out yesterday by Ashley McGuire, a journalist, called Sex Scandal the drive to abolish male and female. This book maps in excellent detail the extremes to which today's efforts to deny human nature have catapulted. Differences in strength and endurance between men and women have been ignored and standards for physical fitness altered in the armed forces, police departments, fire departments, and more. For the first time in American history, women stand a real chance of being drafted into combat positions. From the dangerous to the seemingly ridiculous, the drive to rewrite human nature goes on. McGuire even documents that under ideological pressure, one major retail chain, this is a quote, agreed to eliminate all gender-based signage in its toy, home, and entertainment sections, and clarified that in the toy section they will even cease using pink, yellow, blue, or green paper on the back walls of our shelves." Unquote. She is a mother and she says this has made her shopping extra hard. <laughs> now we can all think of lots of other examples along those lines, but here's the fundamental question. Why the drive toward androgyny in the first place? Who benefits? What is it about our time that makes the attempted abolition of sex differences more attractive or more desirable to some people than it used to be? I believe, again, that the answer is the fracturing of the family has created a new kind of cultural incentive system. The likelihood of divorce, unwed motherhood, and other unprecedented strains on family life are putting stresses on women, in particular, as never before. Consider the popular culture, especially popular music. You may have noticed that popular female entertainers have become as foul-mouthed as their male counterparts. And if you doubt it, just take in any video or Grammy Awards ceremony these days. They bristle with leather and chains and other accessories hinting at violence and force. Now this coarsening of language and affect among women has been noted for over a decade. 
It's been a dozen years since uh, writer Ariel Levy published a f uh, the first thorough examination of that subject. She wrote a book called Female Chauvinist Pigs, Women and the Rise of Ranch Culture. But again, the question is, why is this happening? What is driving the drivers here? And the answer, I think, must be at least in part that the collapse of the family has left a great many people more vulnerable than before. Broken homes have put millions of fathers out of arm's reach. And in addition to the emotional and financial consequences of all that, it's also meant the disappearance in the lives of many children of the one figure arguably most able to protect them from physical harm. What I'm suggesting here is that in a world where many women cannot rely on men to be husbands and fathers, some women will take on the prote protective coloration of masculinity. I think one can argue similarly that just as the brokenness of the family creates incentives for some women to take on the characteristics of men, it might also encourage the reverse men leaning in toward femininity. After all, at a time when over half of American children will grow up without a biological father in the house, mainly because dads left or didn't show up in the first place, masculinity is not held in high regard by most of those abandoned women and children. Seventeen years ago, sociologist Lionel Tiger wrote a book called The Decline of Males, in which he argued that contemporary feminism, and especially legalized abortion, had rendered men less effective in society than ever before. I should add that Tiger is not a religious thinker. He describes religion as a toxic issue. The years since that book's appearance have vindicated his thesis well. But they've also made clear another point. Masculinity is not only devalued by many people, it is also denigrated. What is the message of that to a boy? Let me offer an illustration. A few months ago, a lifestyle article appeared in the New York Times that painted what once would have been a shocking picture. This article suggested that today's forward-looking, non-traditional fathers of the kind that the Times likes to document, including the author of the article, prefer daughters over sons. Some men, like me, fear becoming fathers to sons, the author explained. And to defend himself, he added anecdotal evidence not only about his friends, but also uh, about a few statistics including the interesting datum that well-off white parents who use pre-implantation genetic diagnosis select for females 70% of the time, and that adoptive parents prefer girls to boys by at least 30%. In the case of same-sex couples, he reported, the preference is even stronger. Is it far-fetched to think that the seeming rise in androgyny or drift toward androgyny among adolescents and children especially might just have something to do with radically altered opinions like these? Might they just be responding to an ever more furious feminism spoken by people broken by a world they suspect to be lost? Now let's look at a third feature of this new paganism that I think is also related to changes in the family. It's vindictiveness. It's absolutism. Let's consider for just a moment the explosion of religious liberty cases. Uh, here's a quick checklist. There's the fire chief in Atlanta who was fired when it was revealed he had written a book defending traditional Christian beliefs. There was the Christian staffer at a daycare center who would not address a girl as a boy 
and was fired for that. There was the coach suspended for saying a prayer on a football field at the end of the game by himself. A teacher fired for giving a curious student a Bible to read. A young Marine who was court-martialed for pasting a Bible verse above her desk and not taking it down. And other cases now making their way through the courts. Secularist progressivism, a.k.a. the new paganism, shows no desire to live and let live with cases like this. And this march uh, over what was once protected religious expression isn't just happening in the United States. It's actually all over the Anglosphere uh, with Great Britain in the lead. Here are just a few cases from Great Britain. There was a teacher fired for praying for a sick child which her managers defined as bullying. This word bullying is coming up with increasing frequency in these cases. There was a Christian health worker who was disciplined for bullying and harassment after asking a co-worker if she would like a prayer, and the co-worker said yes. There was a couple who were denied status as foster parents because they said they stood by the usual unpopular verses in the Bible, particularly Leviticus. There was a delivery driver fired for leaving a crucifix on the dashboard of his company's van. And a couple of street preachers sent to jail for speaking by what were called, uh, sorry, speaking what were called threatening words, meaning uh, Bible verses. And then back to the United States, there are institutional manifestations of this same absolutist animus the attacks on Christian charities like adoption agencies, emergency pregnancy centers, the de-recognizing of Christian student groups like InterVarsity uh, and others on campuses, the continuing attacks on homeschooling, and other manifestations of what Pope Francis has even dubbed the polite persecution of believers in advanced societies. And all of this too, I think, is joined to the perception that the traditional family cannot be had. Beneath all the noise about religion in the public square, one can hear the themes of loss and fury, fury about a world that many perceive to be gone. The song of contemporary feminism and contemporary progressivism is not joyful. It is a lamentation in disguise. In saying that family change is driving religious change this way, I don't mean to suggest anything too simple-minded as a single cause to a multi-dimensional phenomenon. But it does seem that no matter which feature of the new paganism we inspect, the same pattern appears. What sociologists call secularization is not happening in a vacuum. It is not happening independent of the radical changes to the family that have been unfolding for over 50 years now. No, secularization and the ascendancy of the new paganism are fallout of those same changes. The diminishing of the family in Western civilization is an unseen player, maybe even the most important player, in the diminishing of Western religiosity. And now for the good news. In closing, I would like to make four points about the future of family and faith in light of this new paganism. The first and most important reason for hope is that we mustn't be misled by what I would call retail historicism the kind of historicism we see all around us. The kind that says we're on the wrong side of history and all that. If retail historicism were true, then one would expect to see family, uh, sorry, one would expect to see religious decline in a straight line trending ever downward. This is not what history shows at all. 
And here I'd like to cite a little bit of evidence from how the West really lost God, which gets into this in, in more detail. But in defiance of the inevitability argument, we can see instead that religion waxes and wanes in the world, strong one moment, weaker the next. To study the historical timeline, for example, is to see that religious vibrancy and family vibrancy go hand in hand. Conversely, so do religious decline and family decline. Where you see one, expect the other. For example, the years following World War II and leading up to 1963, although largely forgotten now, uh, were a time of tremendous religious revival not only in the United States, but across the Western world, including in some places that are pretty secular today, like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and parts of Europe. Attendance was up and profession of belief was up. In the United States, religiosity was so pronounced that the chief sociologist of religion of the time, Will Herbert, could write in his classic book, uh, Catholic, Protestant, Jew, Protestant, Catholic, Jew, um, that the village atheist, he said, is a vanishing figure on the scene. That's what life was like from 1945 until 1963. Strikingly enough, that religious boom overlays perfectly with something that is a lot more familiar, which is, of course, the baby boom. And the baby boom was preceded by a marriage boom. Again, across the Western world, the war was followed by an increase in marriage and babies. The point is that these things are obviously connected and that these two things fuel one another. Something about families uh, increases the likelihood that people will go to church and believe in God. Some of these reasons are prosaic. One, because mothers and fathers want a moral community in which to situate their children. Uh, a Baptist pastor said to me on the radio once that he was unsurprised by this thesis because almost every new person he sees come in his church is coming because they have a baby in their arms. So in this humdrum and yet profound way, the creation of a family literally drives some people to church. What I think is more, is as interesting and less documented is the converse of that argument, which is the lack of a family can be assumed to have the opposite effect. We do know from social science that people who are married are more likely to go to church than not, and that people who are married with children are far more likely to be found in church than single people. The point is to connect those dots, to explain that the trends aren't mere coincidences and that all of these examples undermine the dominant narrative of the inevitability of religious decline. In 2015, some particularly powerful evidence for the importance of family to faith came in from the PRRI and Religion News Service. It found that Americans raised by divorced parents are significantly less likely to be religiously affiliated later in life. 35% of children of divorce were not part of any religion, as opposed to 23% of everybody else. So plainly, families matter to faith as transmission belts for belief that are unlike any other. Now, let's consider the opposite example that also undermines the claim of inevitable decline. What is the most secular territory on Western Earth? Takers, most secular place in the Western world, is Scandinavia. And what is arguably the most atomized place in the Western world, measured by the number of people who don't live in a family at all? That is also Scandinavia. In Sweden today, almost half of all households are households of one person. In Norway, it's 40%. So again, what's happened in the Scandi Scandinavian family, which pioneered skyrocketing rates of out-of-wedlock births, uh, 
and other novel kinds of family formation is obviously also affecting Scandinavian religion. The causal relationship there is two-way. Each institution needs the other one to reproduce. So, moving on to other signs of hope. The sexual revolution, like all revolution, is producing counter-revolutionaries. I'd like to give, as a sort of visual uh, impression of that, the cathedral at Chartres in France, which uh, was the greatest cathedral of its time until it disappeared in a fire. And it was rebuilt within 50 years into the cathedral we know today, the Gothic masterpiece that still stands. And the point is that the people who built that cathedral, many of them uh, were burned in the original fire. And I think that's what we're seeing just beginning to come out of the sexual revolution. Counter-revolutionaries burned by the revolution. And at the rate things are going, there will be many more. Uh, as a friendly amendment here, I would like to quote Russell Moore, um, who I think has a beautiful phrase illustrating the way hope is always around the corner this way. He says, the next Billy Graham might be drunk right now. <laughs> and that's something else we shouldn't underestimate, which is the, the power of Christianity to speak to sin and redemption. A third reason for optimism is simple arithmetic. Seven years ago, a demographer named Eric Kaufman in England published a fascinating book. It's called Shall the Religious Inherit the Earth? Uh, he is a non-believer, and his answer, spoiler alert, is yes. The religious shall inherit the earth. The reason is what he calls an iron law of demography. Religious people have children. And this is true, interestingly, across the board. <coughs> Mormon, Jewish, Muslim, the more religious you are, the more children you will have. And for reasons that are not understood, that, that sociologists haven't even uh, touched, to my knowledge, is the converse of that, which is that secular people have few children, if any. So in the long game, Eric Kaufman would argue, demography is on the side of faith. And then there's also one final lesson from small age history, which is that Christianity uh, has faced obstacles, sometimes enormous obstacles, throughout its history. The mere fact that the Roman Empire ended up largely Christian speaks to the religion's resilience and suppleness and ability to inspire. The success of missionaries in bringing faith to people who believe differently in uh, almost every other language on earth is also testimony to the ability of the faith to speak across time and inter alia to undercut that narrative about inevitable decline. It is also true that one by one, well, it is also true, although I don't want to make too much of it, that one by one, the overt tormentors of the faithful, those who have claimed to have the mantle of history on their shoulders, have ended up as history's rejects. The Reformation, uh, didn't kill the church, the French Revolution didn't kill Christianity, global Marxism, Leninism didn't either. And that, I think, is the case for optimism in a pagan time. Thank you, and I'm um, happy to have a conversation.